What I want to do is give you a snapshot of some of the kinds of data that are coming out now on uh, monitoring effectiveness for restoration projects and also give you a, an idea of what some of the concerns are in terms of things on the horizon that we're going to have to contend with at a variety of levels both I think in terms of what's working and what's not but also legal issues. So there's lots of projects going on now, lots of stream restoration projects, lots of wetland uh, restoration projects. Um, in terms of ways that they have been monitored, historically they've been done by, for example, tracking miles of riparian zones replanted. Uh, in many instances, particularly streams, it's been visual assessments, sometimes just photographic pre and post. And then more recently, physical measurements, often which are only one-time measurements. So what I want to do is talk briefly about three things. Mostly, most of my time I'll spend on the first one, and that is what kind of data are we getting now in terms of monitoring effectiveness and you know, what kinds of approaches are being used. Then I'm, I'm going to move into this issue of what are the concerns on the horizon, and it turns out that one of the biggest concerns is getting at distinguishing structural changes in an ecosystem from functional changes. And then the last is I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, what Lisa and I are doing in terms of trying to put together the current knowledge that's in the peer-reviewed literature or, or literature that's fairly well validated uh, that perhaps could lead to some specific recommendations on what we should be monitoring. Which, and that project is, is not completed yet, so you'll just hear a little bit about how we're approaching that. Now, in terms of rigorous studies, uh, what I mean by that specifically is that they have several characteristics. One is that they're quantitative. Uh, two is that they have either a control site that's being looked at comparing the restoration site to, or there's pre and post restoration data. In an ideal world, you have both. You have pre data and post data on the restored site, as well as either a degraded sort of negative control site that hasn't been altered, or one that is considered a desirable state, a least disturbed site, maybe, maybe a forested site. Those are few and far between now. Here's an example of some good quantitative data. This is work that Scott Stranko and myself and others have been putting together looking throughout Maryland at biological attributes in streams, urban streams that have been restored. Those are the dark triangles versus the open ones. In how they compare, this is a, an ordination plot, so they're clustering differently than those streams in terms of their biological components, biodiversity and so forth, from streams that are degraded and also from streams that are restored. So that would be sort of the first level, but it's sh sh clearly showing you that the restored streams aren't clustering with the reference sites. Here's some work from uh, Sonja Janig in Germany who looked at 26 restoration projects pre and post restoration. If the, the dots are below the line, it means that the, at the site actually was performing more poorly after the restoration. If it's above the line, it means things looked better. Um, Along this axis is how the managers of the projects ranked the projects. So if they're at this end, they were ranked largely successful. Then she did assessments on site at the projects and the colors indicate the outcome of that. If it's red and yellow, it means actual field assessments of the health of the system were poor or bad. So what you can see is there's a disparity between sort of subjective rankings of the site, how they're doing, and what the actual outcomes are. And there's a pretty even spread in terms of some projects seem to be uh, causing um, more harm than good, although because these aren't dated in terms of how long they've been in the ground, we have to be careful with making a statement like that. It's normal for some disturbance to occur immediately po post-project. Here's another example of a quantitative approach to figure out what's working and what's not. This is a synthesis project where I looked at data in the published literature and I found 78 independent stream and river restoration projects primarily in the US, Europe, and Australia. And of those, these are ones where there was a statistical analysis, either pre and post or restored versus some control site. Out of 78, only two had significant increases in native biodiversity. The most common metric for stream restoration, I'm obviously emphasizing that more because it's my area, um, is biodiversity. Historically, that's been what people have looked at, so there's more data on that. 
these are just examples of a couple of the studies where you see this is number of taxa is really no different from the disturbed versus the restored in the reference. This, that one is in Sweden, this is in Indiana, you see the lines aren't any different over time between restored and um, reference sites. Now, the best scenario is when we have quantitative data that is done over a long period of time. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. This is primarily Solange Filoso's work, one of my colleagues at CBL. Unfortunately, we don't have pre-data, but we're preparing to do a new set of studies where we're going to have pre and post over time. Um, the design for this was we were interested in asking if stream restoration, if the effectiveness in reducing the downstream transport of sediments and nutrients differed between headwater channels and ones at the tidal boundary. So the restoration projects were at different sites within the watershed. Now what we did with this is a rigorous budget for nitrogen and for sediments where we measured uh, inputs going into the stream reach that was restored compared to what is coming out at the bottom of the restored reach. So in the tidal boundary stream, this is literally emptying into tidal waters. This was done for three years. We have sampling throughout the year, every two weeks, and then during storm events very, very frequently. And that's the kind of thing you have to do if you really want to know if a project is resulting in a net reduction in the movement of sediments and nutrients. If you skip seasons, you don't know if there's a massive efflux of material out during that single season. Um, if you don't get storm events, obviously you're, you're missing a big part of the picture. What has made this really tricky and has stimulated the next set of projects is if there's a steep slope at all, particularly in these upper channels, you get significant inputs of water and nutrients potentially from the groundwater and then from little lateral surface flows along the restored reach. You have to account for that and that's very hard to do. It's hard to measure. It's easier to measure groundwater inputs because we can use a conservative tracer than it is to measure the surface lateral inputs. Here's some results from the, some of the streams we've been looking at. This is just coming out. So these are the upland streams. These are the lowland streams. These are all coastal plain streams in Anne Arundel County. What you see is this is a net export. So this is a, a, taken over a three year period. This is the low flow conditions. I'm not going to show you the, the storm flows, but I, I could, could show you that. What you see is that during low flows, we have very little evidence of any retention in the streams that are in the uplands. That these numbers are actually below zero, indicating, suggesting they're actually exporting more. In fact, these are not statistically significant from zero. For the lowland streams right at the tidal boundary, we actually have evidence that some of these are retaining nutrients. This is just the nutrient data. We also have sediment data we're working up right now. The variability here and here was too high, and these are negative controls, so these are degraded uh, controls. Um, just an example that this kind of rigorous work, I'm just giving you one slide out of a huge study. This gives you another example of the kinds of interesting things that can come, come out of work like this. We found that the form of the nitrogen leaving the restored sites was often very different than the form coming in. So for example, in this case, when you look at what's coming into the restored reach at Howard's Branch, we have a lot of particulate nitrogen. When you look at what's going out, there's been a huge reduction in particulate nitrogen. Some of the streams we looked at, you get a lot of inorganic nitrogen coming in in the form of nitrate and a lot of organic nitrogen going out. What this tells you is a couple things. One, if you don't measure, all the species are at least total particulate and total dissolved. You really don't know what's going on in the system and if it's retaining significant amounts of nitrogen. Um, okay, what's coming on the horizon? So now I'm sort of to the second part, and that is that we know a lot of projects have been implemented. We're wondering, are they really working? And by working, I mean if we look at the actual functionality. So the last study I showed you was, it was literally looking at nitrogen reduction and sediment reduction. Here's an example from wet a wetland study, and there's now, these are coming out, there's one for Florida, there's three or four that have evaluated the ecological outcomes of created wetlands, most of them done through mitigation projects. 
Um, this one looked at to what extent did the projects that were done in the state of California comply with the mitigation requirements and compliance was actually very high. But when they went out, when Rich Ambrose and colleagues went out to the sites and actually did measurements in the field, what you see is that most of the projects, about 80%, were suboptimal to poor ecological conditions. What I'm trying to emphasize here is this is sort of a look-see kind of approach. At best, it would look at structural measures, like is there some water present there part of the year? This is where they're actually saying, is it doing the kinds of things it's supposed to be doing? The idea is that there's a difference between me measuring structural attributes of a system versus functioning. Functional attributes for monitoring really refers directly to things that are rates, that are measured over time. So it integrates what's happening seasonally and annually. So they're dynamic. We've had a long history and it's not unique to the Bay, it's all over the world. Europe right now, they have a new freshwater framework directive, they're struggling with the same thing. We've had a history of measuring things at point in times. What was the temperature that day? What's the nutrient level? Doing this seasonally. You might as well not get any data, to be honest with you, if all you're going to do is go out and get seasonal uh, measurements of, of a nutrient and you want to know if it's retaining uh, nutrients. You actually have to do it over time and you have to get measurements that tell you if the process is working. Now, I want to put a caveat in here. You don't have to do this for every project. I'm not saying that. I know we don't have enough money. What we need are smart designs where we select restoration projects either of a type, of, a, a type design or in different settings. Do a lot of thorough evaluation on those and don't bother monitoring all the other ones. So I'm actually fairly critical of the way the 2010 monitoring data has been distributed with small pie. So every project has to be monitored. Most of them aren't going to be monitored in a way that's going to provide us a lot of learning kind of information. Uh, what concerns are on the horizon? What um, One of the things that Lisa and I have really been focused on is that we think until we have more information, there needs to be much better attention paid to targeting and site selection. We talk a lot about targeting. We want to, in practice, targeting is typically not done. And yet, this is from something that Lisa has, has worked on. But the idea here is simply that if you look at restoring a system where it's completely degraded to being completely healthy, and you think of this as the amount of work you've done which r removes some stress on the system, that it's not a linear relationship, that you may not see much change in the system and the functionality until you reach a, a certain point and then eventually it'll level off. She's just trying to make the point that if you consider where you are on this curve, you can have a bigger bang for your buck. So uh, delta 10 in terms of your effort on the project is going to have a much bigger impact here in f the functionality of the system than it is here. This would suggest maybe putting your money into super degraded sites may or may not be good. You have to think about the setting. Okay, and then to just get towards the end, in terms of what we're doing with a NIFWIF project, we know, I read a book about a year ago called We Can't Wait on God. <laughs> we can't wait on all the science to be done. We know that. We have to come up with ideas about what to do. And so we have spent a year or more going through the literature in detail and trying to ask what is the evidence there to support certain types of metrics for use in monitoring. And so we've done this now for non-tidal wetlands, tidal wetlands, streams. We've got somebody that's working on, at Virginia Tech on the agricultural BMP end and also somebody working, uh, Alan Davis, on the stormwater end. And it's been a very extensive process where we've identified um, structural metrics and asked, are there scientific studies to show that those structural metrics people are using actually represent functionality? Um, and then we've been looking at <clears throat> whether or not in what settings quantitative metrics are appropriate to use or you can use qualitative metrics. And just to give you a sense of some of the early findings or conclusions we've been reaching from some of our analyses is that um, it's pretty clear that restoring isolated structural components doesn't generate the, the desired functions. And it's easier to understand this in streams because we've had a two decades of work that's, that has been focused on restoring channel shape and, and structural attributes. 
um, and that has largely not led to functional increases. Instantaneous measurements of dynamic processes are typically uninforming. Going out in one day and measuring discharge or four times a year, it just doesn't really tell you that much. And I know it's hard to give up monitoring, but there's, it's true. If you don't do enough of it, it's really not worth anything. Same thing if you have a highly spatially variable system and you're only looking at one area. So we've seen studies who've made conclusions about nitrogen reduction benefits in a stream restoration project, but have only measured denitrification rates in one bank in that stream. It is so variable, you really have to do this over much broader um, uh, spatial areas. It turns out that bioassessment approaches oftentimes are not particularly useful. And the reason is they will tell you, if, so if you have the right bugs in a stream or you have the right plants in a wetland, it may tell you something about whether, you're, what, <coughs> excuse me, whether you are at the point you want to be or not, but you're usually not, and it doesn't tell you anything about why you're not there. There are other methods that you can put your money into that will tell you more than knowing that you have a depauperate biological community. That's not a popular message that we've distributed, but it's really true. Um, and the last one, I think, is that species are, nece are not necessarily um, a demonstration of what's going on at the population level. And the example I like to use here is marine protected areas. We're seeing a lot of studies that say we have more fish here, we have more fish here. Well, it may simply be an aggregation effect. Until you have information on productivity of that fishery, you really don't know if that MPA is having the kind of benefit that you want. Oh, and then there's the last one, just that metrics can provide both positive and negative outcomes early on in the project, which I already uh, mentioned earlier. Okay.